Welcome to the Ajvana Podcast, where we illuminate subjects in the IT infrastructure space. Get ready to hear some amazing insights from outstanding individuals that will change the way you think about IT. And now, here's your host, Mark Teeley. All right, welcome to another edition of the Edgevana Podcast. Uh, today, uh, your host, Mark Teeley, is joined by the famous, and some might even say infamous, Anthony, aka Tony Wanger. Um, Tony, it's uh, incredible uh, to have you on the show. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, uh, I, uh, this conversation is going to make me wish that we had more than half an hour. Um, and, and I guess we spent the... Uh, the other half an hour of an hour talking even before we started the the podcast so we get i get my hour regardless uh from tony but um again tony welcome to the show um tell us a little bit about what you're doing these days tony thanks mark i really appreciate it well i have uh i sold i've been consistently invested in the internet infrastructure and data center world since the late 1990s and found myself in early first quarter 2018 having sold uh, the vast majority of my data centers. And then by the first quarter of 2020, having sold everything, we had uh, an additional data center in Asia and had a uh, manufacturing business, all of which my partners and I have exited. And so I've uh, had an interesting 2020, done a lot of advisory work, sized up some interesting opportunities um, and sort of continued to work through the final, final, you know, tax returns and, um, you know, the end of the road for the IO business, um, we built and sold a company called IO Data Centers, which um, there's a lot that goes into that as you, in, in hindsight, when you're looking at all yeah, of the yeah. legal and tax and financial and other implications. So pretty much have worked through all that stuff. So you did all that downsizing. So is that real background or, or are you This actually is actually a real background. Um, the... The, the, this room has a dual, or at least a dual, maybe a triple use, which is during the day, it's my office. On the weekend, it's my watch football games with my son room. Nice. Um, and my daughter wanted to join us, and I invited her, but then she said she had to watch the football game, so it lost <laughs> its appeal. But yeah, no, this is, this is the command uh, central for now. Nice, nice. The man cave. Excellent. So, um, Tony, you know, you've, you've um, uh, built up something of a legendary background in, in helping build out uh, the infrastructure that so many of us have used uh, over the years, um, uh, especially in the data center space. Um, you know, give us a little, uh, you know, a, a two or three, four minute um, history lesson of, you know, where we've come in the last 20 years. Sure. And I, I mean, I can only share, Mark, sort of through a lens my own lens, which was very exciting in the 1990s, right? With analog cell phones. And um, I remember I took a class at a university as a, you know, an older professional and they um, had us downloaded off the internet and I think it was 96, that was sort of the big deal. And I will say this, I became absolutely fascinated with the data center space. I sort of was a conviction long, I'll take the over kind of thinker on it. I just, virtually everything that ran into software and 10 years later, Mark Andreessen, I think coined it perfectly, software is eating the world. And I just kept seeing it over and over again. So I wanted to get into that business, um, happened to be in Phoenix working on some radio station deals. And believe it or not, those had like a physical layer of infrastructure, the tower, the network, and came across an opportunity which we ultimately executed against and created 120 East Van Buren, which began life in Phoenix, Arizona as a carrier hotel and ultimately turned it into an enterprise data center facility, had a lot of big fortune 200 types, sold that to digital realty, immediately started over and built IO. So I guess my story and sort of the industry are in some rough alignment, which was we went from no one needs data centers. What are they? I'm happy to lend you money at, you know, LIBOR plus um, 1200, you know, um, would be delighted to be a, 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 you know, sort of a pricey mes lender to you. All the way down to where we're at today, you know, our last, before we sold, we were working on a 
very low single digit asset backed um, sort of investment grade deal. And so for me, and we've discussed this a bunch, it's always hard for me to separate what's going on at the physical layer of the internet from what's going on with the funding of what's right. going on at the physical layer of the internet. And I think that's a story I've continued to really pay a lot of attention to. And I can sort of tell you what is or isn't gonna work and who is or isn't likely to pursue a given strategy often, not always, if I take a hard look at their both source of capital and the expectations that that capital has. So right. I don't know if that answers it, but what, what I've seen is, I, I don't know, you tell me, a trillion dollars invested at least in the physical layer of the internet. Yep. And yet as of last summer, we were massively behind the eight ball and still needed significantly more capacity. No, I mean, that, that seems to be the story everywhere. And I guess that um, is a pretty good lead into um, the first big question um, for us to try and tear apart, uh, mainly you. Um, and, you know, there, is, there has been an enormous amount of investment, but um, what's, what's stark, and I'll, I'll give a couple of things for us to think about, and we can potentially use those as part of the conversation. What's really stark to me is that um, as much as we've built, right, we've Microsoft, we, we look at Microsoft in 2017 and, and, and Amazon and Google, and we say, oh my God, they're massive, only to find out that they're planning on doubling in the next 18 to 24 months. And then, doing, and then doing that again. And they're continuing to almost do that. Um, when you look at the overall market of cloud, growing at a compound annual rate of about 25% um, year over year, um, that's, and you think about the size of the market now versus the size of the market in 2010 for total data center square footage and total compute in those data center um, uh, locations. Um, it's, just, it's just a mind boggling number when you hear Google say, we're going to spend in 2019 $13 billion in the U.S. alone on infrastructure. And then you hear companies like Gartner saying that at the edge, we're likely to create um, three times more data outside of the public cloud data center and the on-premises data center for edge development um, uh, in 2025. And so you, you think about there is a lot of money in the market right now. Um, you know, what, what's that money pointing to? Is it pointing to, um, to uh, poor decisions? Is it pointing to um, the fact that, that people really see no top to the, to the current investment opportunities relative to data centers and, and base infrastructure? You know, just what do you think? They're all the right questions. I, I think my take on it, Mark, is that this is the later innings of a very early game in a series, right? Be and I say later innings because we, we've seen the pitcher a few times before, right? We've been up there. And so I think maybe an answer to the question, um, there's a lot of money chasing the industry generally. I think to, to express it sort of in the positive, a lot of it makes sense to me. This is a growth area. These companies are growing. If you look at, I mean, coronavirus um, in 2020 were a, an odd, um, almost uh, test of a lot of these um, investment thesis uh, ideas, but more digital, more at home, more work from anywhere, um, more digitized um, entertainment, um, even podcasting, or, you know, has, has really um, taken off. And so I think a lot of it is rational, and I think investors look to follow big trends and follow the revenue and follow the, the, the spend. That said, like all good opportunities, it should attract in capitalism, it should attract too much capital eventually, which will cause uh, prices to go down and some of the less maybe skilled or capitalized operators to seek other avenues, combine, consolidate, you know, fair amount of that. It would be very rare in my view, to have a capital intensive industry, right? We could call that energy, oil and gas. You could call that airlines. You could call that towers, right? We could go, you could call that shopping malls. None of them have 25 to 40 different competitive platforms knocking right. out billions of dollars against each other. So it's a matter of time before the industry consolidates down to the two to five real players. Um, I think many of us in the industry would tell you that's already started to happen. Right, right. And so 
you know, when you when you think about that consolidation and um, uh, and you mentioned a minute ago that some that maybe just aren't doing it as well as others. Um, how do, how does the um, how does the, the the buyer the builder um, who's you know capitalized some investment maybe something that's worth uh, you know a small building that's worth fifty million or even something that's worth two hundred and fifty million um, how do they attempt to uh, save themselves in this market? financially uh, and and what are the vehicles for them what are what are the options for them or is or is that decision um, uh, just and the opportunity for them one of one of luck at this point if they're if they're not the right people in the right place yeah I think it's more than luck I mean there's a lot of incredibly intelligent uh, people and investors and operators in the space it's actually pulled people in from telecom from energy from banking right? because it was an outsized opportunity. I just think at some point, markets are really good at identifying anomalies and filling them. And the market does that routinely. Um, and then at some point, then you get into, I think in the public market, they'd sort of talk about, you know, can you create alpha? It, it, creating beta in the public markets. Okay, well, we all own the S&P 500. It went up this year, that's great but you're not gonna pay a manager extra money to deliver the market return because you can buy that for almost free. Yeah. So you're looking for alpha, you're looking for outperformance. And I think increasingly outperformance in the internet infrastructure space is a tough discussion because there's so much money flowing into the space. And um, the tendency of the very large scale capital markets, right? So when you're talking about pipelines or oil and gas or airlines think about it american airlines leases planes from somebody whose sole job is to buy planes and lease them out and even right. like mlp pipeline assets right between the the people um originating the source of energy and ultimately distributing it at retail there's this pipeline conduit literally a financial and vapor conduit in the middle right we don't really have that in the data center. We have a massive vertically integrated um, mosh pit of right. money operators, lenders, um, e even some of the services providers have gotten into each other's businesses, right? right? Some of the brokers now are, are managing data centers and some of the data center managers are buying data centers and some of the REITs who were passive are now active so there, there's this huge, and I think it's great. I think it's capitalism, and I think we'll get to the right answer the way we always do, which is by a bare-knuckle brawl, right? If you go back to, and the only thing that I think is a similar, if you look at sort of what was going on in the United States at the advent of, like, uh, energy and gasoline, right? You had a couple people that ran away the oil monopolies, Right. Then you had a bunch of people fighting it out and eventually, and including some government intervention, eventually straightened things out. But in the meantime, it was a bare knuckle brawl with billions more than right. billions right. at risk. So, and I think we're at that part of the story, I guess. Was the yeah, and I, I think that makes sense. So there's, there, you know, there seems to be um, a dichotomy, but I believe that, you know, if we tear the, uh, the, um, the layers of the onion back, we'll find um, an answer as opposed to seeing it as the dichotomy it appears on the surface. And that's, you know, you hear the stories like we were talking about even before the podcast of of people ha having to compete and you know saying uh, you know I'll offer you uh, seventy dollars a, um, a kilowatt you know that kind of thing. Um, uh, how much of that is because we have the dichotomy is that why would anybody ever be in a position to have to offer seventy a kilowatt if the market can't build fast enough? And I realized within that. There are dynamics of specific markets, uh, timing for market entry, the time between when you see a market as being ripe for opportunity, by the time you actually go to pluck the fruit, uh, it's two years later and three years later, by the time you've raised the capital, identified a site, built a property, got your first customer in, you're on the downside of whatever boom was happening at the time in the market. And that's compounded by the fact that all of the friends that followed you into the market are, are adding to that very problem. But um, 
outside of, you know, a specific market where there might be oversupply for 18 months or something, um, how much of that $70 a kilowatt or $90 a kilowatt is about true pressure because of oversupply versus, um, uh, you know, kind of a logical direction as capability and service offerings improve and get more standardized by the bigger players? I think it's a very astute observation. I, I guess I would come at it, Mark, from this angle. I think it says more about who the money is really than what the money is, which is if you are a pension fund or an infrastructure fund for pensions and sovereigns, and let's talk about who's investing in this space now. Countries, really big, wealthy countries in their sovereign funds and yep. pension plans, which are either sovereign and or uh, typically non-taxpaying, non-for-profit pools of capital, you know, the teacher's fund or the municipal workers fund. Yep. And so what they by and large want is consistency for actuarial reasons, right? If we had a seven and a half percent return for the next 12 years, right, our, our numbers um, foot. Yep. Um, so they want consistency. And I think they also want a, a level of simplicity. Um, I'm not sure anybody's ever been successful going to a pension or a sovereign and explaining to them how unbelievably complicated the data center services market is. Um, and so they have agreed to invest in it in sort of a, the most straightforward way they can identify. So big hyperscale triple net leases. Well, again, I mean, if Microsoft, to just name a name, leased 100,000, um, pick a name, uh, tractor trailers from me, that piece of paper I could sell at a cap rate because it's an right. obligation of a Fortune 20 company who's a AAA investment grade rated obligee. Yep. So yep. I don't know that, I, I, so I think that the point being that the current capital wants a return, it wants a dividend, it wants a 7% return paid quarterly. That's the opposite of Silicon Valley, right? In Silicon right. Valley, they're like, here's what we're gonna do, we're gonna throw a hundred million dollars at the problem of people not being able to pin arts and crafts images to the same board. And in 2026, we're going to trade out of it. And in the meantime, they don't really care. Right. I mean, they care about a lot of key metrics, time on site, number of users, number of uniques, number of new users, number of affiliates, but they don't really care about a 7% dividend in January. Right. So that to me is the dichotomy here is that a lot of this space is much more technologically complicated, much more, um, I'm going to say the devil's in the details, but right, much more, right. You were saying like, it's fine to say, oh, there's an oversupply of, of data center capacity. Well, there's probably today an oversupply of airplane capacity in America, but that doesn't help me if I'm in Phoenix and want to take a nonstop flight to Cheyenne, Wyoming, it doesn't help me at all. There's yep. no capacity. So right. it's sort of the same, like if you and I needed a giant 20 megawatt data center spec in Dallas, I think we're in pretty good shape, right? Right. If you and I needed a 20 megawatt spec data center in Boston on Route 128 for biotech, to my knowledge, we don't have any options, right? Right. right. So I sort of think that's what it is. I think that it's like that old cartoon from the New Yorker, like that, uh, dogs and owners start to look alike a little bit, right? Yep. I sort of think the same thing is true for a provider and their capital source. Do they value consistency? Do they value dividends? Do they value growth? I mean, at least three of the big publicly traded REITs in the data center space, Mark, are not materially growing. And yep. they, two of them got called out for it this quarter and another one will. Um, but again, maybe it depends on what their owners want. A lot of REIT owners want no dilution ever for any reason. Right. A lot of Silicon Valley tech startups want to fuel this race car no matter what. Those are diametrically opposed investment uh, objectives. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So coming out of the, the kind of the direct investment discussion relative to data centers and thinking more about, you know, what's, what's likely to be the path forward for the data center operator. Um, and this is a little bit different from what we discussed, uh, you know, prior to starting the podcast. Um, uh, and it's I've, I've like come up with three or four different ways to ask maybe the same question, but are, are and feel free to, to, to riff in any direction you see fit. Um, are we at a stage with data centers now 
um, that the operators, the telco operators, should have realized they were in 15 years ago. And in, in explaining that a little bit more, I will regularly be overheard saying that the operators should have learned, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, that the network was, was the superhighway system. And the superhighway system is expected to be free. What's expected to come from that free passage on the superhighway system is more ability to grow in other areas, more ability to basically tax or profit off other services and capabilities and economic development associated with using that superhighway, in this case, the networks. The networks are by virtue, similar to data centers, um, a bottleneck for global growth. We have historically, even though you could argue that if everybody lit every part of cable that's available in the world today, we'd have massive amounts of extra bandwidth available to us. But the fact remains that many of our applications, many of our work environments are still dictated by how much we can afford to buy and what's been made available to us, depending on where we live or what kind of work we're doing. And so how, how, how and when and or does that same recognition come to the data center market? And if so, what do data center operators do? Well, and I hope that your use of the network as an analytic, I hope we're able to glean all of the smart lessons learned and avoid a couple of the more painful chapters. But the, the answer there was way too many competitors. People don't realize this. Somewhere on the bookshelf back there, I have uh, Home Malik's uh, Broadband. It's um, mm. in which he describes the fact that actually more was lost on telecom in 01 than dot com. It was a trillion yeah. dollars flush. Yeah. And bankruptcy lawyers that I know would tell you that they actually had been involved in a lot of bankruptcies for a lot of years. And it was pretty rare to see no bids or two cents on the dollar for gigantic assets. Because um, there was just nobody who wanted them and they were way out of sort of ahead of the demand curve. So the lesson of the, I'll, I'll come back to your question, but let me just, what, what I understand to be the lesson of the network is that it is massively benefited by economies of scale and scope and that being a subscale network operator i mean maybe you could get away like you could be a, like there was the guys in la who had a great cool you know uh, la connect um you know you, you can get away with a great boutique niche opportunity that eventually gets rolled up by somebody else right um at the end of the day, you wind up with a, a level three, which I'm doing this from memory, so you'll have to give me, but if I'm right, you know, Quest, US West, level three, Global Crossing, Wiltel, Broadwing, ICG, TW Telecom, I'm sure I'm missing five others, are for Florida Power and Light, I think, are all one company now. Right, right. Right, that was 10 companies that are one. Um, and then they're competing against two giants um, at and and Verizon, who I, I sometimes wonder whether like the people there even care what level three is doing. I mean, maybe they right. do. Um, I don't know. They, you know, they're putting out $20 billion a year a piece in wireless CapEx, at least. Yep. Yep. Um, so as a lesson for data centers, I think it is instructive. I think it would make sense to see massive consolidation, economies of scale, um, standardization. There's just way too many different approaches to different things. And where a lot of these ecosystems take off is with standards. Think of things like Bluetooth. Think of things yep. like USB-C, uh, right? As soon as you can standardize, right, everything on the, the, the supply chain gets easier. Yep. So I would expect to see a lot of that in our space, but I would expect to see some people have, um, less than stellar exits. And I think, you know, a less than stellar exit isn't a wipeout, but you know, you combine with a competitor or you sell a portfolio. There's one right now being sold city by city as opposed to a portfolio. You yeah. know, so-and-so needs a data center to plug in in city A, but they don't really need cities B and C. So right. I would expect to see more of that. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. So, you know, uh, kind of wrapping up on that, um, and 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 you know, coming to the close of the of the podcast, unfortunately, um, how important is it for the data center operator? Um, you know, regardless of of how they got invested and 
and what their um, original skill level was with you know making their investment decision, their location decision, all of those important things that you and I could talk a whole hour on just in site identification and and reasoning and, and justification, et cetera. What are the um, what are the things or what are the importance of trying to differentiate on um, on the services that they offer on top of their platform that is the data center um, and or um, you know bringing a new level of customer experience right i think that's the right question mark and i think we're at a point in the industry where we've done it back to the i think we a lot of our providers look an awful lot like their capital providers so yep. i think and and this is an old analytic which is who's really the customer here in a, in a you know is the customer the two megawatt data center uh, lessee, right? Who also, by the way, wants network, cross-connect, rack and stack, network monitoring and package delivery, unboxing and yep. security, yep. right? Versus, but they're being told, no, we can't do that. That's not readable income. That's ordinary income. We don't really do that. Well, let me introduce you to another guy. Or the read investor who is cashing a 6% quarterly dividend check, they're really at that point, they're the customer, yeah. right? Trusts have beneficiaries. So the beneficiary literally is owed a duty by the trust manager to, to maximize their interests. Um, so I think to your question, I, I think we're at a point where the better, faster, smarter companies, and I would certainly include Edgevana, are going to start to focus an awful lot more on what the customer wants as opposed to which bucket the capital provider prefers their capital to silo in. Right. right. And so I think there is a lot of opportunity. And I, it's funny, I mean, you and I've had the discussion edge one, one company's edge is another company's core. Yeah. Like yeah. it really depends on who you are, what you need, where you need it. Yep. Um, but if you're going into some like giant REIT saying, I need all these custom services. Oh, and six months of free rent. That's a tough ask. Right. Um, but, you know, maybe you're willing to pay for it too, right? But it's and just so, structurally maybe not in keeping with how they're set up. Right, right. And, you know, I have I think you and I had this conversation and, and, and uh, I find um, uh, oftentimes the audience doesn't feel the same way about it that I do. But um, I, I, I can be a little bit of a purist when it comes to thinking about the service that I'm offering. And of course, for a part of my career, whether it was working for someone else um, uh, in selling data center capacity or building data center and managing data center capacity for the company I work for, the same thing was still true is that um, I believed that my focus should be um, maintained on those things that, that continued to drive value um, out of the my set of responsibilities. And my set of responsibilities was um, keeping the customers of the data center happy, whatever that meant, right? Does that mean, you know, better maintenance schedules on the air conditioning units? Does it mean turning over hardware um, a year earlier than the best real, uh, you know, investment would uh, would ask for because it gives me a little bit better uptime or a little bit better corporate sustainability or a combination of both? Um, what do you, do you see REITs as potentially, in a, you know, in a long-term play standpoint, have a different... Um, cause a, a, a negative effect on the owners as far as the quality of their service uh, for their customers and the quality of their product? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'd say it this way. I don't want to call it negative or positive, but there's no doubt there's an effect. And the effect is it's by far the lowest cost of equity capital that's been identified. Even if it's an infrastructure fund, it's almost always set up as a read. A read is simply an IRS um, designation. You can decide to be taxed as a trust as opposed to a C corp or another format partnership. Yep. And there are benefits and burdens to that, I guess is all I'm saying. One of the massive benefits is you can go raise billions of dollars at single digit cost of equity capital and then attract billions of dollars of debt capital. Um, and to an industry that needs a half a trillion dollars over the next 20 years, more, depends how yep. you define the opportunity, right? So that's incredibly beneficial. And I think, um, likely to continue. On the other hand, you know, there's a lot of things customers want and need. And, um, you know, if you were told, hey, on your American Airlines flight, 
you cannot buy the seats on your right and your left and have a little bit of elbow room because our aircraft lessor won't allow it. You'd be like, well, yeah. I don't care. I want, I want it, right? I want higher density. I want lower density. I want more network. I want less network. I want right. you guys to be responsible for managing the- I, wa I want to pay based on my demand load, based on right. the quarter. I load. actually need yeah. this twice a year because I'm in retail, but I don't need it the right. rest of the year. So right. some of that at the very high end is being taken out by the cloud providers. And there's still a little bit, I mean, one of the secrets we don't talk about a lot is how much of this stuff is still in house at big corporations, right? Yeah. Some of it yeah. is still just being done ad hoc in house. But I do Absolutely. think that there's that big middle part of the market, different geographies, different needs, different quantities. And I think even in different periods of time, right? So and so, I get institutional investors who won't talk to me about anything less than a ten-year lease. I'm like, all right, well, that's fine, but seventy percent of your market just went away because seventy percent of data center leases are not more than ten years. Not unless you're in Asia. Yeah, in right. Asia, it's easy to get a long-term lease like that. Seven years is the short lease, but in right. the U.S., seven years is a long lease, generally speaking. Yeah. So I think a lot. I think, like I said, I think a lot of these projects start to look like they're provider of capital, and I think they're. I, we've seen a lot of the benefits to that. I, my only suggestion, and it's not to be negative, is my, my guess is there's also some burdens to that approach yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, lots of lot. And again, the, the, I think to focus like a hawk in the next 18 months is all you have to do is look at returns on invested capital. That's it. There's people either returning on, like if you raise capital for 6% and return nine, you can play that game to billions, right? Yeah. But if you yeah. raise capital for seven and a half percent, and return 6.9 percent problematic problematic and i the more i, I look at that. the math the more i can't ignore what i'm looking at right right no, that makes a lot of sense well tony uh, this has been a fantastic um tour through through the um a little bit of data center history and and certainly what's going on today um you have any you know closing statement you'd like to make uh, kind of a last takeaway for, um, no, no, I just how appreciative I am, Mark, that you invited me to do this. And I'm excited by what you and Subham are doing. And um, I think, again, I think these are super exciting times to be in the internet infrastructure space. It's just you, me, a bunch of other great people and a trillion dollars. I mean, what could go wrong? What could go wrong? What could go wrong? Well, I appreciate the comments. Thank you very much. And it, it is an exciting time. I agree. And um, uh, I, I, I think. I think we're going to still be, as much as we believe we, we have reasonably good foresight, I think um, even those of us with the, uh, what might be considered pretty good vision are going to be surprised uh, over the next five to 10 years of what comes out of um, internet infrastructure. And, um, uh, and, I, and frankly, I don't think people are giving um, uh, demand the edge and the impact of things like low code, no code on people and even in IT building more applications and being able to buy just in time resources from from almost anywhere for almost any period of time for for pennies or dollars or millions, depending on how much audience they want to get access to. Um, and so that's a that's a dynamic that, um, you know, is incredibly different from the early days of the Internet. Um, but uh, I would argue that, you know, where we are from a holistic standpoint, thinking about edge and, and other factors around accessibility and work from anywhere, et cetera, I would argue that we're probably somewhere, uh, you know, using your point earlier about downloading a, a class outline in 1996, is that we're somewhere around 1993 internet relative to the edge. And, and, and you knew, you know, based on that time period um, that, between 1992 and 1996, it was nobody even freaking knew what the internet was or how it would be used or why it would ever be worth money to, if you didn't have a website as a mid-sized company or larger, you didn't exist. Four years. That's fucking incredible. Pardon my French, but that is just incredible. And I think we're going to see that same kind of thing um, around the edge over the next five years. So it'll be interesting to well, watch. Well, I'll leave you with yeah. this, Mark. I totally agree. And I actually sent you the an article, but the red queen effect is something a mental model people think about and talk about. And it just is the notion that, and it was named after sort of the Alice in Wonderland uh, interaction, but the notion that while one competitor is running, right, so are all the other ones. So this is a dynamic analysis, which is to say in the four years you just described, 
if you're not online with very smooth working uh, collaboration software and the ability to distribute video and the ability to show a project in 3D um, yep. or the ability to have a, God forbid, third party hospital read a scan or on and on and on. These things are going from luxuries to just absolutely considered um, you know, bedrock requirements of various industries. And yep. um, it's not gonna build itself, right? Yeah, no, I, I actually, you, you, you hit on a point that I've made a couple of times recently, and now we're extending the length of the podcast, so I apologize to the audience. Thank you for continuing to listen. Um, the, um, the notion that, um, you know, what is today a novelty or a toy becomes tomorrow's minimum success criteria for operating your business. And, and in that, some of the early players in the internet space who have built Edge for their localized facilities, um, and their localized facilities could be a manufacturing facility inside their supply chain, uh, or it could be um, the retail outlet of a particular retail giant. Uh, when I say localized, they've already discovered that the advantages that being able to deliver some kinds of new capabilities at the edge are not things that they can reverse. They can't just say, oh, we'll go to paper tomorrow if it's down. Their store is either operating or it's not. And so Edge becomes this new, it's, it's not an extension of cloud for, for lack of a better description, because if it's dependent on cloud, that very uh, problem that I just uh, suggested becomes an issue and it's deliverable, right? It's, it can't be guaranteed to be available if somebody draws a backhoe through your fiber um, or, you know, AT&T or Cox or whoever it is comes out and, and plays with the connections uh, out on the street and you don't have a, a sharp-witted data center operations person to run out there and yell at them about working in during production time, you've got the risk of losing access to all of the things that might actually now be minimum requirements for success for that location. And so I think that dynamic... Oh. Totally agree. Yeah. And I actually, maybe this is a topic for a future discussion, either yeah. on podcast or otherwise. But yeah. um, I think that you run into a dynamic there. You've got all of that happening, but you've got, um, again, all this upheaval and change and um, adaptation going on at the same time. And so there's going to be mistakes and things that are expensive. And but the, the, the nature of the digital world being binary, I yep. think is sort of what governs all of it, which is you're on or you're off. If it if yep. you're off the ace, is it the asymmetry of economics, right? Your global supply chain or your ability to swipe credit cards or your ability to deploy trucks is down hard. Yeah. Yep. Um, as opposed to if you lost the swiper at one of your subway restaurants, okay, you've got thousands of others, but not right. so much at the internet infrastructure layer. Right, right. No, I, I think this is actually, I'm going to, I, I want to add more, but I think this is actually a great future conversation. So I'm going to save it. But um, Tony, again, thank you very much for joining. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I, I hope everybody appreciated this and um, be sure to watch for our next episode, likely in the next couple of weeks. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Mark. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Edgevana podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast listening app or on YouTube. To learn more, visit www.edgevana.com. Thanks for listening and be sure to join us on our next episode.